And so, yeah, as is the last talk, this talk will be kind of pretty vague and technical details and, and very general. Um, so I want to talk about a, a certain class of, of quantum field theories. So the kind of thing, thing I'm, I'm interested in is um, just like a very basic example would be a, a scalar field theory um, on a compact Riemannian manifold M. So here we have, these don't seem to last very long. There is. So here we have a field phi, and um, the action functional is going to be the integral of some Lagrangian. The kind of standard example is um, what's called the phi 4 Lagrangian, where we take combination of phi Laplacian phi plus phi fourth, and the kind of quantities physicists want to understand are these uh, functional integrals. So what we do is we integrate over all fields phi, we put the exponential of the action, and we multiply this by some observables. And this, this quantity, whatever, if one can make sense of it, is supposed to be like some kind of probabilistic correlation function between these various observables. Um, So we've already had one talk about quantum field theory. Actually, many of the talks have been about quantum field theory in some sense, but uh, one of the talks has been very close to this, namely uh, Scott Sheffield's talk. Um, so Scott was talking about the, the Gaussian free field. So suppose our Laplacian phi was of the form, or sorry, Lagrangian was just phi Laplacian of phi. Then, then the field theory is called the, the Gaussian free field. And as Scott explained, we can think of, um, so we have some kind of in, infinite dimensional vector space with some kind of Gaussian measure in some sense. And then phi, we can think of a random function for this measure. Um, and this random function is the Gaussian free field. But as Scott explained, phi is, in fact, is not a smooth function, but it's a distribution with probability one. Um, so the quantities physicists are interested in, for example, for this phi four theory, would be something like. Um, say the integral of e to the minus, of e to the, say, phi Laplacian phi plus phi fourth over h bar. So we can think of this as the expectation value of e to the integral of phi fourth over h bar for this Gaussian free field. And from this, we can see why this doesn't make any sense. It's not just that it's infinite dimensional. It's because phi is a distribution with probability one. So we can't take, you can't multiply it by itself. Um, okay, so however, physicists try to make sense of these things, and this is what my, my talk will be about. Um, so there's some very nice idea, which I think hasn't percolated as far as it should do in the mathematics literature, which is I think a really beautiful and fundamental thing in, in physics, which is this idea of Wilson and Kadarov and others about um, effective action. So the idea is that, well, we don't really know what happens at very, very high energies. Everything we do is occurring at some low energy, uh, but processes at, at low energy, at an energy up to energy lambda, are, um, described by a low energy effective field theory. So this low energy effective field theory is described by this quantity, this low energy effective action, which is a functional on the space of low energy fields. So um, I'll say a field phi is of low energy if it's a sum of eigenvector vectors of the Laplacian whose eigenvalues are in this interval. Um, so the thing to observe here is that this is a finite dimensional vector space. Right? So we can compute, 
So in this effective field theory, I should have had this before, we can compute our correlation functions and, and we can do everything we want and there's absolutely no problems. Um, Okay, so this is a, so this effective field theory is a, it's like a simplified finite dimensional model for the actual physical theory. It's kind of analogous to, for instance, using a lattice, which is another thing people do, but you know, here we're instead throwing away the high energy fields. It's, um, okay. So, suppose we know what happens. Um, if we have an effective action at scale lambda, this will tell us everything that happens at all lower energy scales. So in particular, it should tell us what happens at scale lambda prime. So we would expect a formula expre expressing the effective action at scale lambda prime in terms of the effective action at scale lambda. So this formula is, is called the renormalization group equation. Um, this, this particular form was derived by Wilson. So it's some kind of, it's a very natural thing. So the idea is our energy lambda prime effective action is going to be a function on the space of fields whose energy is bounded by lambda prime. And how do we figure out what it is? Well, we take our energy lambda action but we integrate over all fluctuations of our low, low energy field phi by a higher energy field. So that this low, low energy guy is just obtained by averaging, averaging over the high energy fluctuations of the low energy field. Um, okay. Um, so and as this is a finite dimensional vector space, there's, you know, there's no problems in defining this, but I'd like to think of this as, I'd like to think of h bar as a, as a, a formal parameter. So really, all, all of the quantities here are some kind of formal series in h bar. Okay, so if we take a kind of positivist point of view on this, every experiment one ever does is going to be measuring some quantity that occurs at finite energy. So, I mean, whatever quantum field theory is, it, well, we don't really know what a quantum field theory is at the continuum level. Whatever it is, it should give us effective theories for all energies lambda. I mean, we're making some kind of assumption that, you know, there isn't some fundamental energy scale at which things become discrete, but if we su suppose things are really a continuum, whatever quantum field theory is, it should give us these effective energies at all lambda. And conversely, because every experiment we do is really a measurement of one of these, the entire data of a quantum field theory is encoded in these effective energies lambda, uh, these effective energies S, S of lambda for various lambda. Um, so I'd like to make this into into a definition of what a quantum field theory is. So, so, so the definition is quantum field theory is firstly an effective energy S lambda for all, all energies less, less than infinity. Of course, the energy infinity effective action won't, won't be defined. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, these should be related by the normalization group flow, of course. But there's another axiom we'd like to impose, which um, comes from the locality axiom of quantum field theory. So, I'll make this more precise in a second, but the idea is, as lambda gets bigger and bigger and bigger, our effective action, S of lambda, is, is something occurring much, with much smaller scales in the manifold. So there's some kind of asymptotic um, way in which this S of lambda is a local quantity. So let me explain what, what I mean by a local quantity and what this means intuitively or physically. So, so a, local, a local quantity, so a local functional, well, this is something you, you, you know. A local functional is something which is the integral of a Lagrangian. So 
S of phi is the integral of some quantity which only depends on the Taylor expansion of phi at a particular point x. Right? So, one, one, if you read a quantum field theory textbook, they will start off with some local Lagrangian like this and then try to make sense of the quantum field theory. And what, why they require locality is that like, if you have two different particles which are separated by some large distance in space time, then they're not going to interact spontaneously. They need to be some, I mean, they only interact if they're very close to each other. So, um, so we, we require instead of actual locality some kind of asymptotic condition just because, you know, actual locality is something one might expect to hold at infinite energy. Infinite energy is like, kind of like at point-like scales. Whereas we only, we only know about finite energy effective actions, so we shouldn't expect things to be actually local. So what we find is that our finite energy effective actions S of lambda must have a large lambda expansion, which may involve terms which are singular in lambda for lambda large, but the coefficients of this large lambda expansion must be local. So, so what does this mean physically is that, well physically means that if we consider our effective theory at energy lambda, then particles which are separated by a large distance, uh, I don't think that should be one over lambda, that should be one over lambda, yeah. So particles separated by, by a large distance interact very, very weakly. Okay, so let me just, let's recap. So, so then our definition of a quantum field theory is a collection of these effective actions describing an effective theory satisfying this locality axiom. Um, okay, so, so far I haven't said anything. I, we don't even know if there exists any such quantum field theories. Um, but the, the first term is that in fact there are many. So, so the theorem is um, there is a bijection between the moduli space of such quantum field theories and the space of local functionals S with values in OR of H bar. So, <coughs> so now the idea is that, where's the, the, the idea is that, well, S plays the role of some kind of initial value <coughs> at infinity. Uh, So, um, maybe we can see this better on the next slide. Um, okay, so, we all, we think, yeah. So, even though the energy lambda effective action doesn't exist, we can still make sense of some kind of renormalized version of it, and that will be this S. So, let me explain. See, I'll come back to this in a sec. Let me explain why, how is this theorem proved? And what's, what's the basic idea? So the idea is, well, suppose you give me a local functional, how do I construct the quantum field theory? So how do I construct the low energy effective actions? Well, you should think that the local functional you give me, because it's a local point-like object, that this local functional plays the role of the effective action at scale at energy infinity, whatever that means. So we could try to define the effective action at energy lambda by doing some functional integral, just like before, some renormalization group type functional integral over all fields whose energy is between lambda and infinity. Now, because we're not, we're not bounding the energy of the field above, this is now an infinite dimensional vector space. So that this functional integral just doesn't make any sense. I mean, one can write down its Feynman graph expansion, but it diverges. 
Um, so at this stage, we realize that there, there's various ideas in the physics literature for how to make sense of these, of this kind of type of, of integral. And what they do is they say, well, um, we can make sense of it um, by using the technique of counter terms. So what they say is, let's introduce a cutoff or in our integral. So instead of integrating up to infinity, we integrate up to, up to energy or. And then we subtract off from S some or dependent quantity, this counter term, which is also local. And then we take the limit as or goes to infinity. Okay, so at this point you might worry about how unique this is. And, you know, this seems a little ad hoc, but I'll hopefully explain what this all means in a second. Um, So the counter terms are almost canonical. Um, if they were canonical, we'd be in a great situation that there's a, a bijection between theories and local functionals, which depends on no choices whatsoever. However, that's not quite true. The counter terms depend on a choice we only have to make once, um, which is a choice of what I'll call a normalization scheme. So, um, so the renormalization scheme is a way to extract the singular part of some singular part at infinity of some function f of or. So, another, so whatever the singular part, I mean, kind of abstract way to define this is we have a subspace of this space consisting of the functions whose limit to infinity exists. Let's pick arbitrarily a complementary subspace. It doesn't have to be closed, doesn't have to be anything, just a complementary linear subspace, and this will be a normalization scheme. Um, this complementary subspace will consist of the purely singular functions. Um, and then these counter terms are unique once they're purely singular as functions of war. Okay, I think this is going a little fast. Um, so maybe I should say just a little bit of how, what this all means and how do we, how do we construct the counter terms in some examples. Um, well, well, what's gonna happen is the counter terms SCT are constructed by some inductive procedure so we take our functional integral, which is of some, um, and we expand it as a sum over Feynman graphs. So the first thing that comes up are graphs which are trees, and then, then there are no problems. Then we find graphs which have a single loop, maybe like this. Um, these are the first graphs which are divergences, which have divergences. So we introduce our regulating parameter P, or, so we have, um, let's call this, this graph gamma. So we have this way to attach to the graph, which depends on the regulating parameter. And the limit as or to infinity of this doesn't exist. So our first counter term is simply the singular part of the weights of the graphs with one loop. So let's call this S1 CT. Um, singular part as or goes to infinity. And we're using singular part in this sense, this complementary subspace gives meaning to the term singular part of, and then we take the sum over one loop graphs gamma. Um, 
This is the very first counter term. And then we have to inductively construct the other counter terms attached to other graphs. OK. Um, so let me go back a little bit, and I will explain to you why I'm actually lying through my teeth about various things. So, yes, OK. So the theorem I stated, let's go back one more, is that there's a bijection between the set of, set of theories and the set of local functionals. So this only works. The first constraint is that um, our effective actions are always have a standard quadratic form, namely phi Laplacian, integral of phi Laplacian phi, and then there's an interacting term which can be basically anything. But the uh, second and more important constraint is that, well, I said we were you know, using this cutoff in energy and integrating out the high energy fields. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm lying. Um, so what I, I actually prefer to do is use, use a cutoff based on length, so based on the space time. And uh, this is somehow a little more difficult to explain, but let me explain the very basic idea is that So the, the propagator of our theory is, is going to be the inverse to the Laplacian. So, that, so we can write the inverse to the Laplacian. We can write this in two ways. We can sum over all eigenvalues of, of the Laplacian, one over lambda i e i tensor e i. This is the kernel for the inverse of the Laplacian. Um, and then with this, energy cutoff I'm using, the, 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 well, there's a regulated prop propagator which would just sum over certain, certain of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. What I prefer to do is instead use, observe that the, we can also write this as the integral from zero to infinity of the heat kernel, because this is integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus t of the Laplacian. This is like the kernel representing e to the minus t of the Laplacian. This is some simple equation. Um, so instead, I prefer to use a cutoff where, it, where I integrate the heat kernel over some smaller range. So the advantage of this is that everything becomes very geometric. And we see that from this point of view, we're, we're really just doing some kind of Brownian motion where the Brownian particles can run into each other and interact. Okay, so any, any questions on things so far? Or? Okay, where are we? Ah, yes. Is this the, okay, this is where we are. Um, yeah, so as I said, once we've chosen this normalization scheme, we get a bijection between theories and local functionals by sending a local functional to the low energy effective action defined by taking this functional integral and subtracting off these canonically defined counter terms and then taking the limit as it goes to, to infinity. Um, so you might ask what philosophical meaning does this bijection give us? Well, What it does is it, it tells us that, firstly, it tells us that there are theories in this sense. It's not obvious there are any theories. This bijection tells us that the set of theories is not empty. And more precisely, it tells us that the space of theories is a manifold. It's an infinite dimensional manifold modeled on a particular infinite dimensional vector space. Um, because these coordinates depend on the choice of a renormalization scheme, um, everything we should do should be coordinate independent. Oops. Okay.
okay, so suppose there was, you were a physicist and I, and I came along and said, look, we have this infinite dimensional manifold of theories. He would say this is like completely useless because a physicist would want to, spe to do finitely many experiments and then know which theory he had. If you have an infinite dimensional manifold, no matter how many theories you do, experiments you do, you're never gonna be able to specify which point you land in, right? So, so with this picture, we actually, it's, like it's pretty bad and that we can't make any predictions. So what we need to do is to find some finite dimensional, we need some selection principle which will give us a finite dimensional subspace of well-behaved theories. Um, so what is well-behaved? Well, see, so, well we want this subspace to be naturally defined so we need it to be independent of, the, independent of any coordinates we choose on our space of theory, so independent of what I call the normalization scheme. Um, and this finite dimensional submanifold will be the space of renormalizable theories. Okay, so let me, let me explain what renormalizable means, or at least from the Wilsonian point of view, what, what renormalizable means. So, so there was an idea, maybe it's a bit pejorative to call it old fashioned, but an idea from the, the early days of renormalization theory, the 50s and 60s, is that well, if you give me a local functional and there are only finitely many counter terms, then it's a well-behaved normalizable theory. If on the other hand, there are infinitely many counter terms, then I have infinitely many free parameters and I can't really work with it. Um, you know, I never, I never liked this idea because it seems so, it seems so ad hoc. Um, but from the point of view I'm talking about today, the problem with it is that um, these counter terms, they depend on a renormalization scheme. So the counter terms depend on a way of subtracting the singular part of a function of R. So therefore, this definition is really a coordinate dependent definition. So we must reject it as, as not being a natural definition. Um, but fortunately, if, if you read, I think, so I, I spend a, you know, much of my time trying to make sense of various physics textbooks, and one problem with the current crop of physics textbooks, which physics knowledge, is that um, the, the Wilsonian point of view, which is developed in the mid-70s, mid has somehow not really made its way to textbooks yet in a, in a very good way. So, um, but there is, like much better definitions of what it means to be normalizable out there. So, um, so in particular, there are definitions which are expressed directly in terms of these effective actions, which is what we really want. So I'm gonna give you a definition which I'm not sure entirely who it's due to, maybe Wilson or maybe Weinberg or, certainly mentioned with, you know, in conjunction with these names. Um, and I'm, you know, I hope I'm not uh, doing any violence to our ideas, but so the idea is that your theory should be considered to be well behaved if as we take lambda to infinities, these effective actions don't grow too fast. So the problem is, um, say this. so taking lambda to infinity I mean, because energy is like one over scale, so taking lambda to infinity is, is like zooming in further and further on a manifold. So we're trying to take some kind of scaling limit of our theory. And if, as we take our scaling limit of our theory, everything just blows up to infinity, well, we can't say that this is a theory which is well behaved at high energies because the perturbative expansion will just break down at high energy. So we, we, shouldn't, um, we shouldn't regard it as a nice theory. However, the subtle point is that we, we really should measure everything in units appropriate to the energy scale we're looking at. Or, where's the area? Um, so as I said, since energy behaves like one over length, you know, if we look 
we look at a box of radius one meter, or in a circle of radius one meter, we should measure in meters. But then if we zoom in, we should you know, look through our magnifying glass and we scale. So in this smaller, smaller region, say, we should measure in millimeters. So that what we should do is simultaneously zoom in on our manifold, but then we, we scale so that everything has the same size now. Oh. Um, OK, so one problem with this, of course, is that we can't, you know, we should really be working on ORN if we want to talk about rescalings. And to be honest, if you want to talk about energies and lengths, or you know, changing, you know, changing energy scales, we should really work on ORN. So the rescaling we need to do, well, this change of units is a rescaling. So what it is is we, we take the coordinate x, change it to LX, but also we're also free to rescale the size of the, the field of variable. So if you like, the field is a map from or n to or, we can also rescale the or bit as well. And it turns out the correct thing to do for a scalar field theory is rescale by L to the n over two minus one. So as I said, we want to measure these, these effective actions as lambda goes to infinity, but after we've rescaled in this way. So we define so this orgy sub L, by this equation, we let orgy sub L of our effective action, we do two things. We change lambda to L squared lambda, and we rescale our field phi by this, in this way. And then our definition of renormalizability is that the theory is renormalizable if we look at, when we look at any of these quantities and let L go to infinity, we find at most logarithmic growth. Um, so we're, because we're kind of doing some kind of rescaling thing, a log, log, logarithmic growth shouldn't really be regarded as very bad. Um, I'll maybe say a bit more about that in a minute. Okay. So, sorry, Jim, what time did I, did I start? You started at, I think it was Twenty five minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, so one nice feature of this of this operation, which we recall is changing lambda and then rescaling on Rn, is that if we have some collection of effective actions defining a theory, so some collection of effective actions satisfying the renormalization group equation, then we find, in applying this operation, we find a new collection of effective actions also satisfying the renormalization group equation. So that this operation defines a flow on the space of theories, um, which we can call the, the, call this the local renormalization group flow. Um, so as I said at the beginning, the space of theories is isomorphic to the space of Lagrangians, or the space of local functionals. So we can take this flow and transfer it to the space of local functionals using this bijection. So then we find a flow on the space of Lagrangians. Um, so this flow is called, well, I'll maybe just write down some simple examples so you get some idea. If we take the Lagrangian L of phi to be um, Laplacian of phi plus some constant times phi to the fourth. Then applying this flow, well, what we find, we find the same thing. We can expand this. There's going to be various terms. It's an expansion in h bar. 
the next term is that we change this constant C by a logarithm of L. So there's some universal guy, I think it's something like pi over two to the fourth. Uh, I can't remember precisely. H bar log L. And then there's gonna be other terms as well. Um, right, so maybe this example will be pretty important in a minute. So yeah, we find this flow in the space of theories and if you read the physics literature, this flow is called, at least the dependence of the coupling constants on L, it's called the, the beta function. So here the beta function for phi four theory is just is this logarithmic term. So, and we defined renormalizability to mean there is at most logarithmic growth in this, in this parameter L. Why, okay. So maybe the, maybe people need some convincing that this logarithmic growth idea is, is a good one. Well, I suppose the idea again is another idea of Wilson or Kadanov or someone like that is that there's really, this, uh, this definition is, a, is an approximation to some non-perturbative ideal definition. And the ideal definition is that, well, if we knew how to make sense of non-perturbative quantum field theory, there should be some kind of scaling flow on this non-perturbative quantum field theory, and a theory should be renormalizable if as we take our scale, we go smaller and smaller scales, we converge to a fixed point, so the limit would be some kind of conformally invariant um, quantum theory. Um, however, I don't understand non-perturbative things. So when we take everything to be a formal parameter, it's kind of difficult to tell whether or not we're converging to a fixed point or not. So let me give you an example. Suppose we have a single coupling constant C, and that C changes to L to the minus H bar of C. Now, so I'm treating H bar as a formal parameter, but a real physicist would say, actually H bar is a very small positive number. And the difference is that L to the minus H bar of C has a limit as L goes to infinity if H bar is a small positive number, but we're treating as a, as a formal parameter. So for us, we seem to see this logarithmic growth. So what we're saying is that logarithmic growth at the perturbative level doesn't really exclude that we convert to a fixed point. Polynomial growth might exclude converging to a fixed point, but with logarithmic growth, we should, you know, we should be okay. We, we might be okay, we not, might not be. Um, okay, and with this definition, we find we can classify the renormalizable scalar field theories, for instance, on, on, on any or n. Um, so the one basic example is the one I've written down here, this, this phi four theory. We find the space of renormalizable scalar field theories in R4, which are, we'd like to be in variant under as many symmetries as possible. So firstly, all isometries of R4, but also changing phi to minus phi. The space of renormalizable theories is the same as the space of Lagrangians, which include, well, the standard quadratic term uh, the phi four interaction and possibly a mass term. And these coupling constants C and M are going to be formal series in H bar. Um, so I maybe just derive a little bit of why, I suppose I won't say why this, this is true, but one can see that this, this theory is definitely not a fixed point and definitely has log logarithmic growth but it's still, you know, kind of regarded as normalizable. Um, and it's rather easy to calculate. Um, I won't explain why, but one of the beauties of this Wilsonian point of view is that historically, the phi four theory was regarded as normalizable because people did kind of hard computations and they found almost by accident that all, they only need counter terms, which are again, 
copies of the five four Lagrangian. But Wilson came along and said, like the, Wilson said, no, that the real reason the five four theory is Lagrangian, or is normalizable, is that is the way these terms scale when we apply when we rescale an aura n. So we've arranged things so that this term is scale invariant, but, but if you check it, this term is also scale invariant, and this term scales in a positive way. So Wilson's idea was that checking this, you know, checking the dimensions of the various coupling constant tells us precisely which theories are normalizable. Um, and the way things work is that at the, you know, at the quantum level, there may be some anomalous dimensions in the coupling constant which bring in these logarithmic terms. And anyway, so this, this allows you to calculate very easily that, um, so the phi six theory in or, or three, phi four in or five, phi cubed in, um, sorry, phi six in or three, phi four in or four, phi cubed in or five and six are all normalizable, and there's basically nothing else. Okay. Um, so in, in my abstract, I mentioned something about, about gauge theory. So one can ask, can one make sense of this picture um, for, for gauge theories as well? Um, well, 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 to do this, there's some kind of, um, yeah, it's a really beautiful piece of homological algebra invented by these physicists in the 70s. And it's kind of amazing how much, you know, the algebra cohomology these guys know. Um, and so Baton Volkovsky gave like a homological formalism for understanding gauge theories and understanding gauge invariants. And um, in order to fit things with this Wilsonian effective point of view, we need to work in this setting. So what they do is, they say, well, it's, we suppose we have some space of fields which is acted on by some Lie algebra. And everything is infinite dimensional, so this Lie algebra is the Lie algebra of the gauge group. Then, traditionally, what you want to do is somehow integrate over the quotient of the space of fields by the Lie algebra. Um, what Bath and Vilkovsky again, I suppose before them, Fadev and Popov and BRST, but I can't remember what those initials stand for, um, said was that, well, we can work in a more homological setting where we take our ghosts, but consider them as our Lie algebra, we consider them as some kind of supermanifold to put them in degree minus one. This amounts to taking um, Chevalier Eilenberg co chains for this Lie algebra with, with coefficients in the space of functionals here. So it's really a kind of homotopical quotient instead of a naive quotient. And then we need some extra steps. We need to pass to the odd cotangent bundle of this space in order to make sense of the functional integral. I, I, I think I don't have time to explain this. It's, it's, some, some, it's a long story, but it's very, it's very beautiful. Um, so another aspect of this story is that, so whereas before, if you had some space of fields and some gauge group acting on it, and some action functional on the space of fields, we seem to have three different types of data, namely the gauge group with its group structure, the way it acts on the space of fields, and the functional on the space of fields. But in this picture, we get some extended functional on the space, this big supermanifold of extended fields, and this extended functional encodes all of the data you started with. So it tells us about, um, not only does it give you the original action function you started with, it also tells you the Lie bracket on the Lie algebra of the gauge group. It's because some of the structure constants of this Lie bracket appear in the definition of S, and it also tells you the way this acts in the space of fields. Um, we would like this extended action to satisfy what is called the quantum master equation. Well, this is some, I guess, some equation of homological nature, but what it tells you in down-to-earth terms is it tells you that the things you started with satisfy the axioms you would expect of a gauge theory. So it tells you that 
Well, firstly, the Jacobi identity holds. Secondly, the functional you started with is invariant under the Lie action, under the action of the Lie algebra. And finally, well, that's just these first terms, but this term with the H bar tells you something a bit more subtle. It tells you that the Lebesgue measure on the space of fields is invariant under the action of the gauge group. Now, here you might think we have a problem because the Lebesgue measure doesn't exist. And we do have a problem. Because the Lebesgue measure doesn't exist, this equation doesn't make sense. Let me just go it back. It turns out this, this delta term, like calculating delta of S amounts to multiplying two distributions which have common singularities. So this, this term is, is always infinite. So we kind of shouldn't be surprised, you know, because um, the philosophy I want to use is that the only fundamental quantities, the only thing you can ever observe are these low energy effective actions. So everything you ever want to say should be encoded in terms of the low energy effective actions. So with this quantum master equation I wrote down see, on the previous slide, um, this is some equation on the um, infinite energy effective action, whatever that means. So it's not surprising it doesn't make any sense. So to, to get around this, what we should do is um, try and express gauge symmetry in terms of the low energy effective actions. So it turns out we can do this in that um, the low energy expression of gauge symmetry is the equation that this low energy effective action satisfies this low energy quantum master equation. Um, so other ways of saying this, I mean, I'm not really sure of the historical development of these ideas, but um, uh, so equations like this are termed Ward identities, and they're, they're the equations which tell us that things we compute from our field theory satisfy equations you would expect from gauge symmetry. So, I mean, as a kind of positivist person, you should say that um, you should only ever talk about things you can compute, so that gauge symmetry should really be expressed in terms of the equations and things you can actually define and make sense of. Um, but the nice property of this is that if the scale lambda effective action satisfies the scale lambda quantum master equation, then all low en lower energy guys do as well. So that this renormalization group flow we have is some kind of operation which takes solutions from one equation to another. Um, there's, so there's a homological interpretation of this renormalization group equation, which if there's any homological people in the audience, it says, well, at each energy scale, we have what's known as a battle of Wolkowski algebra. And the renormalization group flow is like a homotopy between two battle and Wolkowski algebras. So I think this is kind of strange, is that even if you'd never heard of physics, but somehow thought of battle and Wolkowski algebras, you would have come up with this renormalization group flow anyway, just by thinking about homotopies. OK. Um, yeah, so I think I'm basically done. So I just want to say that um, yeah, so, so so far we have a definition of renormalizability and we've seen some renormalizable scalar field theories. Um, and we also have some understanding of gauge theory in this effect of formalism. So the short question is, is can we understand are there renormalizable gauge theories? And the answer is, well, yes, that if we try to understand um, pure Yang-Mills theory in R4 in this context, the coefficients in a simple Lie algebra G, then the theory is renormalizable in the sense I said earlier, in the sense of this, this scaling condition that we zoom, if we zoom into smaller scales, we only have logarithmic growth. But also, the quantum master equation is satisfied. Um, so more precisely, there is, you know, there is a theory which modulo h bar is just given by the classical Yang-Mills action, 
which satisfies the quantum master equation and which is normalizable, but there's more than one theory. In fact, the moduli space of such theories is isomorphic to a series in a single parameter h-bar. So we should really think of there's a theory which depends on a single h-bar dependent coupling constant. So just like for phi, phi four theory, we had, well, we had dependence on two h-bar dependent coupling constants, namely the mass term and the interaction. Here we just have a single h-bar dependent coupling constant. Um, and the proof of this theorem is, I mean, once we've set up the general machinery, it's actually rather easy. Um, the way it works is, well, modulo h-bar, there is no issues, just because everything, is, everything converges modulo h-bar. So to construct the theory, the higher terms of the theory, we use obstruction theory. So there's an obstruction at each term in h-bar, each power of h-bar, there's an obstruction to be extending to the next term, and there's a cohomological calculation telling us the obstruction group vanishes and there's also a cohomological calculation telling us that deformation group is one-dimensional, so, yeah, I mean, it's actually not, not, not that difficult. Um, and okay, so I think I'm out of slides, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. The problem is that the, the, the counter terms themselves um, seem to depend on the coordinates because they're, in this picture, the, the, the counter terms are just some kind of tool for constructing the bijection between theories and Lagrangians, and if we change the coordinates, we're going to change the counter terms. You change the terms, but you change the fact that there's a finite number? Oh, good question. I, I, I don't know. I mean, but possibly not. I mean, it, it, it may be possible that this picks out some some invariant, sort of some group of changes of coordinates, and it may be possible that this picks out some invariant finite dimensional submanifold. Well, I'm not sure. Yes. Hi. Um, for the gauge theory version, you explained that the theory amounted to be the algebras with homotopies between them. What's the analog for phi 4 theory of that? Um, so for phi 4 theory, what you do is you can, you can basically put anything into the BV formalism. By, by taking the odd cotangent bundle of the space of fields. So there's a similar statement as long as we extend phi 4 theory to include kind of a super partner of the field phi, which is now a, a fermionic field psi. And then the same statement holds. So does this uh, allow you to define probability measures on the space of distributions? I, uh, I really doubt it. Uh, just because everything is like such a, uh, everything is so perturbative. I mean, with all these perturbative parameters. So I don't think so. I mean, one, one can define the correlation functions and observables and all this kind of formal stuff, but not, I don't think you get an actual measure. So are you really touch the supersymmetric Young Nulls theories? Um, I haven't, no, but I think that should be an interesting cohomological calculation. I mean. I, I, would, I would expect to show normalizability there. There's some, some obstruction theory calculation of a similar nature, but more difficult. And I, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Um, the number of the number of the number of the number of yeah, I, I wouldn't really say so. I mean, there's, so there's, there's something else one can ask for a young mill theory, which is that it'd be asymptotically free, which kind of means what you said, I think. Uh, five, four is not exactly. So five four is not asymptotically free, but young mill theory is. So, in in this definition of renormalizable, they both are. But you could you could argue that that is a weakness of this definition, that and that one should really require asymptotic freedom as well as part of your definition. 